Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, this talk I've actually been looking forward to for my two more of this. I've got uh, Ben Nuttall, one of the uh, uh, educators at the Raspberry Pi Org, the foundation, is going to talk about building a Python API. Okay, thanks Tim. So hi everyone. Uh, so this is talking on building a simple programming interface to a piece of hardware such as a hat, something like that for Raspberry Pi. Uh, a bit about me, this is a photograph of me holding some Raspberry Pis. Uh, I work at the foundation in, edu in the education side doing uh, learning resources and teacher training, uh, a, lot of, a lot of outreach, go to events and conferences. I also do software development, uh, stuff like what I'm going to be talking about uh, for some of our internal projects. Uh, and I help run the Creative Technologies program and I run raspberrypi.org. Uh, I'm from the north. Yay. I also <laughs> run this website, pyweekly.net. So this is a bit of a kind of background of what I'm talking about. So in the early days of Raspberry Pi, um, this was one of the original Adam boards that came out. Uh, this is Gert, he was one of the engineers behind the chip that we use in Raspberry Pi, he worked for Broadcom, or worked for Broadcom at the time, and was instrumental in getting the Raspberry Pi off the ground. He built the first Alpha board, very, um, very clever guy. Uh, he created, as I say, this, this was one of the first Adam boards, for the Gert board, he named all his product after himself, <laughs> and uh, it was this kind of incredible like monstrosity of stuff on top of the board that you just say, like, you stick this on your Raspberry Pi and it will do like everything. Uh, it's got all these things on it, and I, I still have no idea what this thing does, but it was like, on paper it was a really good out board and it was great. Um, so it's like, well, what about the software, Gert? And he's just like, you should just be able to learn how to do it yourself and you know you kind of left that to people to figure it out for themselves so there was a few sample bits of c code around that kind of thing um but nobody really kind of got going with stuff like that around that time because it was all very new uh and then things like this start coming out which is kind of a step forward so ryan created this little motor board the rtk 000001 <laughs> and uh there was no kind of api to this but he provided a simple bit of Python code that said, if you drive this pin high and this pin high and this pin low and this pin low, it will drive forward. And if you do this one and this one, you just needed to know which GPIO pin maps to which wheel and which direction, and then which wheel in which direction. Uh, and then you could just drive one forward and it would, and you'd have it driving around. So he provided this bit of code, uh, which is fairly straightforward. Um, and then moving forward a bit, something like this, the Pybrella. So this is a Pi Moroni and, and Sinto put this together. And they created this little board. So it's got your three LEDs, like traffic light LEDs, a little buzzer, a button, and it had some extra uh, pins on there as well. Uh, but they also created a software interface to this. So you could just, in your Python code, you would import Pybrella. So there's no need to actually use the, the RPI GPO library at all. You just used Pyrella and everything was abstracted out into this namespace of Pyrella. So pyrella.light.green.on would turn the green, green light on and that's exactly what you kind of expect to be able to do. Uh, you had the green, you had amber, you had red. It had a similar sort of interface to the, um, to the buzzer and the button and each of the extra inputs as well. Uh, another example, Energini. So this is a really cool Adam board. A, well, they actually make it, they're a company that makes a remote control switch for power sockets. And they ended up making a Raspberry Pi add on. So you just stick that on top of the thing and you send the right bit of Python code to it and it will do the same thing as switching different buttons on the remote. So you can turn things on and off um, with code rather than just with a remote. So again, they kind of pasted this code in and there's like four pages of this stuff and they're saying, yeah, yeah, just paste this into the top of your. Into, into, into the top of your code, and you know that will switch on pin number one, or uh, sorry, switch number one, or something like that. So what we did was we took this code and we gave it to um, Amy Mather, who was, was um, doing a work experience with us uh, last summer, 
And we said, can you kind of tidy this up, kind of work out how it actually works and the logic of it, rather than all this repeated code, sort of try and tidy it up a bit, clean it up. And we wrapped it in a module, and now you just import Energini, and you can tell it switch on and switch off. And you will pass in a number and say switch on number one, switch on number two. So that's kind of what I'm talking about, is getting from having that, all that code that it works, but it's kind of messy, and you don't really want people to copy and paste that and that kind of thing. You just want them to be able to namespace it as turning on the energy or turning on the you know a, a right, the right motor or something like that, whatever the kind of abstraction, whatever wording goes around what you're trying to do. Uh, and it means that people can do this. So with the Amgini module, you can easily drop that into a web application. So this is a Flask app running on, on a web server on the Pi uh, that I'm ac accessing from my phone. I just built a giant button that says on and a giant button that says off. Then I can turn the Amgini on and off. And all I've done there is in my Flask app, created a, an interface that looks like this and attach the action of switch on and switch off to when you press those buttons. And you know you can do the same thing for anything else. So another application of the Energini, we made the Chef Hat, which was an add-on board for controlling a cooker according to a temperature. So maintaining an, an exact temperature of a slow cooker uh, using the energy and, and a temperature sensor from the counter kit. And again, it's simple enough just to drop that module in instead of pasting that whole bunch of code in. So there's a lot of good examples out there of hardware that has um, really good APIs. So the pi uh, these are a lot of these are primaries. The unicorn hat you'll see out there, some great examples. Uh, the camera module, actually the official camera module for the Pi, originally just had Raspberry Still and Raspberry Vid command line tools. And Dave Jones, a developer, uh, just put a library together so you can access, access it from Python, so you import Pi Camera. A uh, bunch of other primary examples. Uh, we've got the Sense Hacked as well, the, the new Foundation uh, add-on board. And this is one made by Rachel at the Foundation, uh, which is a kind of robot garden platform greenhouse thing. So you can control, you know, you know monitor the temperature and humidity and light levels and things of your plant. And that, uh, that's something I worked on, the, the software side of that. So if you look at the Sense Hat, you've got, this is what we're talking about, getting to something like this, where you can import the Sense Hat, and then simply just ask for the temperature, and then sense.show message, and you pass in the temperature, and you've written that to the screen. Really simple, and not worrying about GPIO pins or pasting in bits of code. So who should Whose responsibility is it to create the, uh, the API? So ideally, the company who made the product should be putting out the software to go with it so that people can use it. Um, they should, like Pi Moroni, have Phil Howard. Uh, he's their software development. He's, he's, his time is dedicated to creating software to accompany their project, products. Uh, or secondly, sort of optimally, the, the mug who bought the product and found there was no API, i.e. <laughs> you. Uh, so why should why should the company create the API? So what what are the most fact, motivating factors for them? So they, I want, they they should want to make it easy for their, their users, their customers, to make great things using their product. So if you've made the unicorn hat, and there's you know you have to kind of learn C and kind of figure out think about memory, memory and registers and stuff just to be able to get one pixel to light up green, then you know you're not going to get very far. If you can download a demo that says you know run this and you know it's comedy's game of life or run this and it's random sparkles then you know that's that you're gonna get a lot further a lot quicker. So you can show what your product is capable of using examples like that and share example code for people to to try and, and use as the start of their project. So from the user's point of view, if you're the mug who's decided they're going to write the API, well you first ask them, see if they can if you can persuade them that they, they ought to have an API. Uh, or, or offer to help, um, or you could just do it, um, especially if it's easy. So if you think, actually, this is a really easy thing to do, there's not much to it, just create it and, and see what happens. So, I mean, another reason is that you know you want to use it, don't you? So why not be the one who uh, who creates it so that you can get going? That's what kind of open source is all about: is getting as far as you can on everybody else's code, and then as soon as you get to a bit that you you know you 
you need to fill in the gap to be able to get further, you fill the gap for everybody else who follows you. Uh, it's really good experience doing this sort of thing, so if you're creating an API, you're writing that software, um, there's lots of personal gain there, and it makes your GitHub profile look, look great. Maybe the, that company will hire you. If you, if you made a, um, a library for Pimeroni for one of their products that didn't have an API, you know, maybe they'd go, actually, this guy's really good, we should, you know, we should hire them. Um, or maybe somebody else will hire you if, if they, don't, they don't see that. Kind of a precursor for the rest of the talk. I'm pretty much talking about Python 3 here. Um, but I'm a big advocate of kind of supporting both because it's, if, you're, if you're writing code for Python 3, it's really easy to support Python 2 as well. It's not a kind of a one or the other thing. Uh, and if you start with Python 3 and you kind of, for some reason, you're relying on somebody else's code, which is Python 2 only, then you're, much, you're in a much better position to drop back. If you're in Python 2 and then you want to go forward to Python 3, that's, that's kind of a bit more work uh, in doing that. Much easier to go backwards than, than forwards. Um, so if, if like the, so the garden robot kit that I, I showed earlier, that relied on an Adafruit library where they only produced a, a, a Python 2 version. So I was relying on that, so part of mine was built around it, uh, which meant that without them upgrading theirs to, to work in Python 3, I had to stick mine with, with Python 2. Uh, so that was kind of a pain, but I um, I requested them straight away. You know, can you make a Python three version? It was all written in C, so I, I couldn't sort of dive into it and do it myself easily. Um, but I, I kind of you know requested that they did that, and you know they've got a lot of a lot of APIs, a lot of products, a lot of things to deal with, so they haven't they haven't got around to it yet. But hopefully they will one day. Um, alternatively, you just weep and. Um, and carry on that knowing that your library doesn't support Python 3. So all the examples here, I'm kind of talking about Python 3, but it's code that will work in Python 2 as well. So how do you do this? This is kind of uh, the kind of eight golden steps. So first thing is to write simple code which which kind of works. So that the sort of code I'm talking about people putting on their website saying download this code and paste it into your file. So write that. That's that's the first step. Doing something like that is Definitely the first step. Second of all, you want to kind of design the API and think like what what do I want it to look like in the end? Okay, so I want to import my hat and then be able to go my hat dot temperature or my hat dot red dot light dot dot on or whatever. Think about how you want to be able to use it. Uh, then create an abstraction layer. So this could be functions. It might you might have a function that is you know turn light on, or you might have a class which is you know, an LED which has a property of, you know, that you've a, a function that you can that you can turn it on and a function you can turn it off. Think about like, what you want to be able to do, what it should be able to do. Then turn that code into a module, which is I'm going to kind of talk, talk about in more detail as we get, get through this. Um, which is just a, a kind of, it's just how you structure your files to make Python recognize it as a module and a few other bits. Um, and naturally, I mean, if you haven't already at this point uploaded it to GitHub, then do that at this point. Um, then, then you kind of test that your module works the way that a user would be using it. So kind of install it locally and just make sure that once you've installed it on your machine that it, that it, it works as expected. Then at that point, you kind of know you've got a working module. Uh, you can upload that to PyPy, which is the Python packaging index. And that's where all the kind of Python packages live. So it's a bit like apt. So when you apt get install something, pip, pip install something is kind of where it fetches things from this website, PyPy, by the Python packaging index. Um, so then once it's uploaded there, you have the namespace on it, my, like my hat, people can then pip install my hat. And then they'll, they'll have your code installed and be able to use it. So that's kind of where, where you want to get to. So first step um, was to write some code. So think about example use of the, the product. So I think if, you, if your hat or your board or whatever has an LED on it, then you know think about okay how do we how do I get, get that LED to come on? Well, which pin number is it attached to? Which you know uh, how do I want to access it? Um, and thinking thinking about it that way and actually using the, the GPIO library for instance, and start implementing basic uses, usage. This is the first thing I tend to do is just, if it's got a bunch of LEDs on there, just can I get them to turn all, 
Can I get them all to turn on? Can I get them all to turn off? Can I get them to turn on in sequence? Or do I group them by colour? Can I get all the green ones to come on at once? And kind of play around with that kind of thing. And at that point, uh, you you start to think about like how do I want to be able to access this? So the garden robot, for instance, had um, five green LED. Uh, sorry, three three green LEDs, three white, three red, three something else. And so I kind of and they were placed on the board in a particular order. So I created a list which contained the pin numbers of them in, in the order I wanted to be able to access them, so that I could write a loop which turned each one on in sequence. Um, so think about what the, the API should look like. At this point, I should mention, like API, when I mentioned it to a couple of people earlier, they assumed I was talking about web APIs, because it's kind of a common thing that you access some data for, through a web service that gives you, you know, some, some data from some service. Uh, but API is kind of, I'm talking in the more general sense, it just means application programming interface. It's an interface to uh, something, so whether it's hardware, whether it's uh, some data, or something like that. Uh, and the API is just, like, it's the interaction between the user and the, the program, or the, the data or the service. So then, move on to the next step, which was to create an abstraction layer. <coughs> Uh, so, combining the example code with your API design. So, how did you, you know, you've got your code that was like, you know, six lines or whatever that would turn on the LED, and then you kind of think about how the user would access that in the end. So, it might be a, you might have a wrapper class or something like that, or we'll just put it into a function. Um, so, there's a few different approaches. Um, so, one example here is a kind of procedural approach. So, with your setup at the top, your import G player or whatever. Just cre I've created two functions here. So one, turn the LED on, and it just turns on that LED, which was number two. Uh, so it turns that to true, and then turn the LED off. We just turn it, uh, turn it off. That's a simple, simple approach, very, very basic. So then, in your API, it would be you know, my hat or whatever dot turn LED on or turn LED off. Uh, another example, so we've got a, a wrapper class around this, so we've got a, a my hat, to, so they would create a my hat object, this is a bit like the sense hat. Uh, in it is, um, is what happens when you create a new, a new one of something, so you, when you create a new hat, it would run the init step, which is initialization. So it would set up the LED when you, when you create an instance of the my hat as an output, and then you have these methods on it, which are functions that belong to the object, to turn the LED on or turn the LED off. Or a slightly more advanced approach, say you've got three LEDs there, you might have uh, an LED class that has, um, takes in a pin number, so you know which one your LED, which pin your LED is attached to, and then on each LED they would have an on method and an off method. So this is your, like, your Pagrella, where you have lights.red.on. That's something like this. So that's the first part, and then the my hat class um, takes uh, actually when you create a my hat, it would refer to that LED class, and you would create an instance of an LED in red, instance in amber, and instance in green, and then you have those inside that you could then turn on or off by my hat dot red dot on, for instance. Uh, so, one of the things you tend to do in Python code is so that your kind of declaration of how it all works is at the top, and then right at the bottom, you often see this. It's a little pattern that says uh, if name is main, and all that means is if this program is being run directly. So, if you've imported it, then name is not main. But if you're running this file directly, then do this bit. So, let's run the main main function. In, in here my main function is, this is kind of like a test, so if I'm running this directly, I'm just, I just want to know that this bit works. So it's like, if, if, I, if I'm running this directly, just run my little test script, which is to create a hat and turn the green light on. So if I run this directly, I'm just checking that it kind of works, it's a really mediocre test. Um, so then, to create a module, so this is kind of a very minimal approach. All you need is a setup.py, which I'll explain 
what should go in there. Ideally, a, a README, which is kind of fed into the set of .py, and that's what would be shown on the home page when you're looking at it, when you're browsing it on the Python Package Index website. You'd have your actual code in myhacks.py in a myhack folder. So that's the name of your module. You have a folder, the same name of, of what you want the module to be called and what they would import. You have a file, it doesn't have to be called that, but you know, generally speaking, you would call it the same name as the, uh, as the module. And you have an init.py, and that basically tells it that it's a module by having a folder with a, with a particular name and an init.py inside a folder tells it it's a module. I'll talk more about what is inside these files as I get further on, but uh, a bit of kind of longer version, so there's an optional, optional extras you could add in. So ideally, you'd have a contributing file, which uh, got kind of a policy of how other people, uh, kind of a policy for how other people should contribute code to it. If, they, if you, somebody wanted to add a feature or something, just get them to read that first to say, you know, this is this is how it works, or this you know this is, this is how you should lay out your code, or this is how you should whatever. Uh, it'd be good to have a documentation folder. So here I've got a folder called Docs. You know, it might contain several pages of documentation for the API. Uh, you should probably have a license file as well, just to say what license the code is, uh, and what you know, what, which open source license you're using, and letting people know what they can, what they are permitted to do with the code. Uh, a manifest is something that kind of, if you've got extra files that you need to bundle that aren't Python files, like the Astra, the, so the sense hat library um, has a couple of pictures that are kind of, that it uses in the library, um, and it kind of, so the, you being able to draw letters onto the screen, there's just a PNG that has all the pixel perfect kind of font basically for, for, the, for the alphabet. And, because it's n not necessarily usual to have pictures and things like that in there, you kind of tell your manifest file that there's, right, I want you to include this picture, I want to exclude this folder or whatever. Um, so you've got your myhack folder, so that's your module, and you've got your readme. Another thing is scripts, so you can have a scripts folder which is which enables you to add command line scripts so that you could Somebody could, uh, if you put something in there and declare that there's a script called so and such, it's just it gives, uh, it builds in a um, a kind of default usage for it. So you could type uh, if this was the Pi Camera library, for instance, and there was a script called um, called Pi Camera Test or something, you could run that at the command line, so it's sort of out of Python, and it would be a particular file. Which might just say, you know, run a preview for five seconds. But it means that rather than go, rather than going into Python just to do a test, you could just check that it was there or something, or, or run a basic basic version of it. Um, or if you wanted to have some example code in a script that they could run. So like the sense app might have a a few, you know, for showing the temperature or something like that. Rather than writing a Python file that was three or four lines long, you just run the command line version just to which would have the Python code using the module in it. And I've also got there a, a tests folder, so if you had an actual um, test suite, you would also have that in, in your module as well. So looking at the uh, init.py, so there's two underscores on each side of the init, uh, that's just convention. So this is what my uh, example in it contains. So the top line is just a kind of, that's a Python 2.3 thing, so that just makes sure that the same code works in Python 2 and 3 by bringing in the absolute import function from Python 3 into Python 2. That's a really cool Python feature that means you can use Python 2 but with Python 3 compatibility. Um, and then I've gone from my hat, so like from uh, the document is the absolute input bit, means from the my hat folder inside the current folder, relative to the current folder, uh, import the object called my hat. And this is basically just what you're exposing to the user. So when they import it, they get anything that's in here. 
you could easily just uh, paste in the actual real code into here, and they would just have it by default, but this is a kind of a cleaner approach. Uh, and I've also got the, the people tend to put double underscore version, and they just so that you can import underscore underscore version to find out what version of the code you're running. And in the setup.py, which is kind of the really important bit that makes it possible to, for other people to install, uh, is you're using some tools called uh, something called setup tools, which kind of built into the Python development kit. Um, and you run setup with passing in kind of different attributes about your, about your project, about your module. So you give it a name, you give it a version number, tell it you know the author's name, a small, a short description, which license it is, a URL, and you know some keywords and, and things like that. And kind of what so this install requires is what other Python packages your package relies on. So this is taken from Astro uh, from the Sense Hat. So um, that requires Pillow and NumPy, the NumPy, the um, numeric Python library. Um, just as an example. So I upload to GitHub. I mean, there's a whole other talk, but you know, use GitHub. Uh, so to install the module, so this is, hasn't gone to the internet. Nobody else can really install it without having a copy of your code yet. But you can install your own code locally by running these commands. So to install the Python 3 would be sudo python3 setup.py install. So that's running your setup.py with Python and giving it the install keyword. Uh, and then the same for Python 2 is, is the second line there. That will have installed your module for both Python 2 and 3. So you can now, theoretically, if you've done anything correct, you should be able to check that it's installed. So simple example, just run import my hat in a single line in Python to see if it works. And that will give you the output of, of that as if it's running as a file. And then the same for Python 2. Uh, so you should be able to see that it should just, it, assuming your module doesn't print anything out when you import it, which it shouldn't do, um, that should just do nothing. But if you tried that, I mean, this is what I tend to do if I'm testing it. I've got, say, the PyBrella or Explorer hack or something library installed. But I just want to know that there. I just run this, import PyBrella, and if it comes up with an error, then I know it's not installed. And if it does nothing, then I know it is installed. Uh, but then you can kind of test it's actually tested there by opening a Python shell or creating a Python file and seeing if, um, making sure you don't do this from the same folder as your actual module, because then it will import the one that's in the folder you're talking about. So if you go somewhere else and try and import my hat, it should be globally installed on the system at this point. Oh, that's exactly what I've just said. So, now you want, now you're, if you, if you have any problems with that, obviously go back and kind of fix things and uh, bump the version number and try and, and reinstall it on your system and, and continue until that works. But uh, when you're ready to upload it, um, make sure you've got the, I, I think these requirements are right, I might be, there might be something else, but something like this, installing the Python dev packages and something called Twine. Uh, ensure the namespace is available. So if you browse to pypy.python.org slash pypy slash whatever your thing is going to be called, so energy or you know pybrella or explorer hat or whatever, just check the namespace. Somebody might have already used the namespace for something else. Uh, but if, the, if it's available, then you um, you have to sign up to pypy. So you have a, a user account, and you can either register it through the website, actually like fill out a form saying I'm creating a module called energy, and my name is this, and whatever else, mm -hmm. and what the module is going to be called. Um, or you can do it by, if you've already created your setup.py, and it's got the module name in there, uh, there's a little bit something you need to do just to make sure that it knows who you have to kind of register, and, you know, attach your command line usage of PyPy with your web account. Uh, I think, actually, if you don't have an account, it will create one if you run setup.py register, I think it will actually ask you for a username and things like you can do it that way as well. Then, once you've kind of registered the namespace so that it, it, it kind of belongs to your user account, and that means you have the privileges to upload to it, nobody else does. Um, it's a bit like, um, I suppose not really GitHub because that's subclassed under your username, but 
like anything where you register them in the namespace and it's either yours or it's somebody else's. Um, so if you run Python setup or py sdist or Python 3 equivalent, sdist is source distribution. So that means it kind of creates a, a tarball, which is a like a zip of all of your code. And that's kind of what you would call the distribution in terms of that's what you distribute to other people's computers. They, they would take that as like a zip of your code and they would install it on their machine as is. And it contains the actual source. So it's the code that you wrote in Python. Um, so build that. And then you need to create a built distribution, which is uh, a kind of ready to go. It's not the source. It doesn't contain your actual Python code. It kind of contains a built version of it. So like a, like a bit like machine code for, for Python, really. Uh, and you, that's kind of, again, you should read upon this really if you're doing it, but um, um, the kind of, the modern use of this is to use something called Python wheels. So this example here, Python 3 sets up py bdist wheel, built distribution uh, wheel, uh, and, a, and a universal one is for Python 2 and 3, and it doesn't, it means it doesn't contain any C extensions and things. Um, so you create a source distribution, you create a build distribution, or you can do it in one go by typing all this in. So Python 3 set up py s this b this wheel universal. There's a few variations of that, but most kind of general, if you're doing it in Python on your C, and if you're doing it so it supports Python 2 and 3, and if, uh, and if it will work the same on all architectures, which if it's just Python then it will, then this is kind of what, what you're going to be doing. Uh, so then you've got, so if you have a look inside your dist folders, it will have in your in your module, it will have created alongside your folders and your setup.py and your other stuff, will have created a dist folder, which you should put in your git ignore so that those don't get uh, sent up to GitHub. Um, so it will contain um, these two files, so my hat 0.1.0, pi2, pi3, non a wheel, and the equivalent of a tarball. So that's your source di distribution, and that is your built distribution, the wheel. So it's a .whl, and it contains the information about what uh, what architecture the wheel is for. So this is for any architecture, because it's a universal wheel. It will work, work the same on, obviously, if this is for Raspberry Pi, then you're not going to be installing it on a Mac or Windows or anything. But if it was a general purpose library, then you would need to Especially if it was built in C or something, it might need to be recompiled for different architectures, and you provide multiple ones. But we're just talking about Raspberry Pi here. Um, and it contains which versions of Python it supports and, uh, and all that kind of thing, and the version number is in there. So then to upload this to PyPy, you use the Twine tool that you installed, and just go Twine, upload, and then everything in that disk folder. So if you'd create a lot more packages for, um, for different architectures, then it would just upload all of those. So you send all those up to PyPy, and then you can go and look at it on the website. So go to whatever the namespace is, and you should see it there. It should be available for download. It should say that it's available for download. So at this point, it now exists in the Python packaging index, and you can install it with pip. So on another machine, on the same machine or anything, you can just type this, sudo pip install my hat, or pip 3.2 install my hat for Python 3, and that will do the same as running setup.py. In fact, that's what it does, but it just downloads it from the internet and then runs Python setup.py install. It's exactly what it does, but you're getting it, pulling it down first. <coughs> that should install it the exact same way. So again, check that it's there. Do the the import lines and check that it, check that it works. And uh, you should you should have it, and then you should be able to say to other people that they can now install your package. So if they've got you know an energy and you just created the energy library, then they can just install the energy library with pip install energy, and um, and yeah, you know, they should have exactly the same feature set as you. So just a few last things. Um, documentation is always really handy, so there's no point having a library if you don't know what it is capable of doing without looking at the source code. So uh, I, I, one of my favorite ways of documenting is using something called mkdocs. 
So you write your documentation using Markdown, and it kind of you run MK Docs on it, and it will create you like a full HTML website out of these simple Markdown files. Um, and you can see some examples here. Um, you can upload to um, this, this website, pythonhosted.com. Uh, in PyPy, when you're actually logged in and looking at your own, um, your own modules, there's just a button to say upload documentation. You give it a zip file of your HTML build, and it gives you, a, a, using the same namespace, it gives you pythonhosted.com slash my hat or my module or whatever. Uh, alternatively, you could upload to GitHub pages. That's quite good. Um, and actually, MKDocs has the ability to upload to those things built in. So you can say MKDocs um, upload GH or, or uh, Python hosted or something. Uh, alternatively, um, some people tend to use this thing called Read the Docs. So there's some really good documentation on there. The Pi Camera documentation is really good. And, uh, I, don't, I don't really like restructured text very much because it's kind of much harder to write. There's a lot more things you have to know than, than to write Markdown, but people who use it tend to like it because you can do a lot more um, detailed documentation with it. Uh, so good examples of some libraries. So PyCamera is fantastic, and in fact, anything by Dave Jones. So here's github.com slash waveform80. All of his stuff is just where I go if I need to Think like how would Dave do this? You know, that's, it's a really he's a really good inspiration. Um, the sense hat uh, was done by uh, Dave Honus at Raspberry Pi Foundation with a bit of help from me. Um, so take a look at that as well. Uh, Energini was um, kind of well the code was done by Energini, cleaned up by Amy Mather, and packaged and credit taken by me. Um, and the Explorer hat is a really good library as well, based on the Pygrella library, which is by at one of their previous products, um, and again, anything by Pine Rarity. Phil Howard is their um, software guy who's really good at this stuff. Um, so tips for the reading. So I, I advise you to look up the from future import something. <coughs> it's actually from underscore underscore future. But uh, have a look at that, see what you can do. The documentation page is there. Some really good stuff. You can bring in the print, the new print function so that it works. You get exactly the same behavior in both Python 2 and 3. Uh, absolute import and all sorts of anything that gets added to Python 3 that is possible to, you know, without breaking Python 2, you can just import in, which is really handy. I don't, I don't think there's anything else like that in, a, in another language as far as I'm aware. Um, there's a, a user guide at this URL on, on read the docs. So, that just tells you all of this information um, in much more detail and uh, the kind of the good ways of doing it. Really, really good. That's um, that's the place to learn. Uh, versioning. So, kind of what I tend to do is if, if something's kind of personal and not yet released, just I'm just working on it. If it's a work in progress, I just tend to start with zero. So, zero point one point zero would be my first release, and minor releases tend to go up like this for the third decimal point going, uh, incrementing like that. But then when you kind of add something more significant, a bit slightly more major, then I tend to go for you know, the point 0.1 something, point 0.2 something, point 0.3 something. Um, and then what people tend to do is reserve the 1.0 the one point oh as their kind of, that's, it's, it's now feature complete, it's now finished. So that's what PyCamera did, and that's what we did with Sense Hat. <coughs> um, all this stuff, we're, when we're still working on it, and not everything has been implemented yet, uh, we reserve that to um, as being the null point releases. Uh, and then 1.0 is kind of, everything is finished, and anything uh, new is just kind of uh, either small changes or, or new, new features that we hadn't considered before. Um, and then if you want to go from, say, 1 point whatever, wherever you're up to, 1.3.5, for instance, and you do something kind of completely overhaul it, or and you actually break it so that people using code written for the one point something will now no longer work. If you actually break the compatibility, then you tend to, you know, that's not a, not something you should really do. Just try and plan well so you don't have to do that. But if you do, um, you know, you go to a whole new a whole new release, not just a point release. 
so that's why things like Python 2 and 3 are completely new versions that are 2.7.10 or whatever it is Warren now, and a 3.5 is you know just about ready now. So they're kind of different versions at, at completely different numbers. And the backwards compatibility, compatibility change is why there's such a big, seemingly such a big difference between them in that some code will not work in both. Um, but as I say, plan well and try and avoid doing that. Um, so app to get installed, I mean that's the whole of the talk and I'm not a person to give it. It's really hard. Packaging for Debian. Um, speak to Alex. He's, are you giving a talk next month on it, right? No. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of hard work. I mean, it's, it's not impossible, but it's, um, this is a good place to start. So if you can get your module this far, at least people can, you can share it, other people can use it. Um, and if you want to learn about Debian packaging, and then you can come teach me. Um, have a look at the Debian wiki on, on packaging for Python, and good luck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Do we have any questions? I've got one. Is, yep. can, where can I get the presentation? Because I'd like. To uh, so it. I'll upload it now. They'll be on the speaker deck. I'll tweet the link. Brilliant. Thank you. Andrew? Oh, yes, <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've got a question. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure whether it's related or not, but I noticed that you were using from rather than imports as the, as the first word. Is that a uh, definition within the uh, Python programming yeah. rather than Python 2? Or no, it's, it's existing Python 2 and 3. It's, it's pretty standard. Um, it's pretty much just. Uh, personal preference, which which way you do it. I tend to do the from. Um, let's see an example. So, uh, so you, you have to do it from from future. That's just how that one works. For example, but um, suppose this one. Um, so ignoring the dot, let's just say you're using the module. Normally, this is just how you do it in the in it dot UI. But if you just said from my hat, import my hat. The equivalent is if you just in, just said import my hat, the, the first version, the underscore, the lowercase underscore. If you just said import my hat, then your next line would be, um, you know, hat equals or whatever, a equals or whatever. My hat dot my hat. Right. So it's, it's namespacing it differently. Yeah. So if you if if there were multiple classes, if there was uh, my hat and my dog and my pony. Then it would be, you know, you could say from my hat import my hat my dog my pony, or you could say import my hat, and it would be my hat dot my pony my hat dot my hat my hat dot my dog. Um, so it's kind of a, depends what you want your code to look like. So energy, for instance, um, you could either say import energy, and then it would be energy dot switch on, yeah. or you could say import uh, from energy import switch on switch off. But then that, that I kind I kind of dislike it in that case because so it's then you're not saying what you're switching on because so you brought it into global scope. Stick it on one line. Maybe. Sorry. It's an attempt to stick everything on one line rather than separating into two. Uh, it wouldn't. It wouldn't go into more lines, but it would. Uh, oh, you mean if you're importing sort of several things? Uh, yeah, it could be. I mean, you tend to, you can go into more lines, but it's more about whether you want it to be. I mean that. In this case, because they're named the same thing, mm -hmm. so like Pi Camera, for instance, if you'll see examples say with Pi Camera dot Pi Camera, and if you have to write that out multiple times, you're not gaining any, anything by losing them uh, by keeping the namespace. Whereas with Energini, if it's just called Switch On and Switch Off, you've lost the readability of what you're switching on and switching off. So I, in that case, I would go for leaving it in. Right. Is it a case of like it's? Comparatively, like absolute versus relative naming. Yeah, it kind and, of. Is. And also for code readability as well. Exactly. Yeah, it's what it's down to you. That's what Python is kind of all about. Is make you get you get your. That's why there are two ways of doing it. There sh shouldn't be. There should always only be one. But um, in this case, it gives you the flexibility to choose which to you know you know for yourself which would make would make it more readable, and you have the choice, I guess. Okay. Any more? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.